In this video, we're going to look at another type of loading, and this type of loading is called shear loading. Now, basically what's happening when we shear an object is we have two forces which act in an opposite direction to each other, and they're trying to separate the material, or they're trying to slide the planes of the material across each other. So here we see the force acting on the block, and because there's a perpendicular distance, h, between the application of those two forces, that object is going to shear. We're basically trying to take the top surface and the bottom surface in opposite directions. Now the calculations for this are very similar to when we looked at direct loading. So in this type of scenario, we're going to have a shearing force. And hopefully you recall that our SI units for force are newtons. Now that force is going to be applied across an area. And this time what we're looking for is the area of the shear plane. Now if we refer to our diagram, the shear plane is going to be this surface here. It's basically the surface that's trying to resist this shearing action, or the cross section of the material. And that area in this case is going to be L times W, which represents the area of our shear plane A. Now our standard international units of area are metre squared. So once again, we need to make sure we work in standard international units. Next, referring to the diagram, we have something called h, or the distance between the shear planes. Now, because these two forces are offset at a distance h, we end up with a shearing action. And any deflection that occurs is going to occur when the top surface is moved in the opposite direction to the bottom surface. If that distance h was zero, then no deflection would be able to occur. There would be no material separating the two forces. So in order for a shear deflection to occur, we need a distance h between the two forces. And as that shearing action takes place, we end up with a deflection, which here we're calling x. So the distance between the shear planes, once again, must be in SI units. It's a distance, so it's metres. And our maximum deflection, once again, is a distance, so that will also need to be in metres. We have some additional variables that we haven't seen before, although they're very similar to with direct loading. We have a variable called g, which is the modulus of rigidity. The SI units of modulus of rigidity are pascals. The modulus of rigidity is very similar to the elastic modulus, except it's used when we're looking at shear loading rather than direct loading. Next we have a variable called gamma, and gamma is shear strain. Shear strain is dimensionless. Its direct comparison would be the strain that we saw in the previous tutorial, which was represented by the Greek letter epsilon. Now epsilon we use when we have direct loading, gamma we use when we have shear loading. And finally we have a variable tor, and tor is the shear stress. Shear stress is measured in pascals. So we see a lot of crossover with what we've already done on direct loading. So as we move on then, we have a set of equations. Shear stress is force divided by area, or the shear force divided by the area of the shear plane. Gamma, the shear strain, is the maximum deflection over the distance between the shear planes, or x over h. So as mentioned previously, if there's no distance between the shear planes, then we can't have any deflection. There needs to be a distance between the forces in order for the block to skew. As a result of that, normally when we're dealing with shear forces, we're more interested in the shear stress than we are the shear strain. And finally, we have our bulk modulus, which links our two variables, and bulk modulus is shear stress over shear strain. Now all of the rest of the rules apply that we've already seen. We must work in SI units. So if we make sure we always input our forces in newtons and we always input our areas in meters squared, then that's always going to yield a shear stress in pascals. That's one of the benefits of using SI units. When we come to calculating gamma, we have to make sure that we use meters for our deflection and meters for the distance between the shear planes. If those units are not the same, then we're going to get an answer that's not accurate for gamma. And finally, providing we work in pascals for our shear stress, 
That will always yield an answer in Pascal's for our modulus of rigidity. Although I'm not going to do any specific examples of calculations of shear stress, you should have had sufficient practice by now with direct stress in order to attempt the practice questions on the study platform. Now it probably is worth just mentioning in passing that although this tutorial is focusing on shear loading, the block pictured here is also going to be subjected to tensile loading because what we have is we have two forces pulling in opposite directions. The big difference here is if we were to need to calculate the direct stress for any reason, then the area is going to be different. The area that the direct loading acts across would be this area here. Let's just call this A2 for the time being. So if a question also asked us to calculate the direct stress, then we could do that based on the information we have there, because the direct stress would be the force divided by the area, but this time area 2. And we have the dimensions for calculating area 2. Area 2 would be the width times the height. I guess what this really highlights is the difference in area between the cross-sectional area for direct loading and the area of the shear plane when we're looking at shear loading.